the cloud. So this is being recorded to the cloud, like the last hour was recorded to the cloud. And that was what we were calling 9B, because last week is, was week nine or something like that. And then next week's week 10. So this could be week 10A or 10 pre. So this is the pre-week, okay? And this is the week that really gets us to the final stages of this course. So it's critical that at this time that students feel like they learn something in this course, actually learn something. So I brought Leanne Hill in to teach you something about simulations and about the applications of emerging technologies in the medical field and what it's like to be an assistant director of education in a medical training unit, I guess, or, you know, West Virginia hospitals is no small cup of tea. It's a huge complex there. You would think Morgantown, a little Morgantown, West Virginia, a couple, 20,000 people, whatever it is. No, 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 no. West Virginia's it, it got a lot of money for the medical field. It is a hub, a major hub, because they had the $5 billion man, Robert Byrd, as Senator of the United States uh, 20, 25 years ago. And he made sure the fingerprinting of the, of the FBI was there. He made sure all West Virginia hospitals were well uh, taken care of and much, much more and road systems and so forth. So Leanne knows all this. She was on my, I think, very first research team after I graduated. I had a grant from the National Council of, of Teachers of English and it was on writing as thinking, the impact of writing as thinking. And we were able to take my dissertation research on keystrokes and keystroke mapping and the use of computer prompts on thinking and analyze some of that data anyhow. As Leanne knows, I was really, really bad at publishing things, but really, really good at going to conferences and presenting. Yes. So uh, that the, West Virginia at the time had a governor who was in the federal penitentiary. His name is Arch Moore. His daughter is now a senator in West Virginia. What's her first name? Shelly. Shelly Moore Capito. Capito. Mm -hmm. Capito. Mm -hmm. She's got a, almost as much influence as that other senator from mm -hmm. West Virginia that we hear about all the time, Big Joe Manchin. Mm -hmm. Well, that, so there's a little politics here in West Virginia, West by God, Virginia. Um, and, and, and Archmore was in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta for buying votes. He was a Republican paying people to vote Democratic. It was, a, it was a, you know, paying people to vote Republican. At the time, West Virginia was a Democratic state, much different than today. And so the FBI got him behind the dumpster. I don't know if he's in Wheeling, West Virginia or somewhere, paying people money to vote in the election to vote Republican. And he mismanaged. $700 million of the $2 billion budget, basically a third of the state budget, he was mis and others helped him mismanage the money, put it in the stock market, kind of like today, everything's going down, 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 like my 401k. Um, so we had, he had this, so he's in the penitentiary. So my first three years at West Virginia, we didn't get a pay raise. <laughs> we didn't have a lot of money for many things, but what we had was, to go to conferences. And I was really good at applying for that money to go to conferences. I wasn't much good at much of anything else. I uh, had a good baseball team. As Leanne knows, we won, I think we won a trophy or the something. Cognitive like that. connectors. <laughs> a cognitive connectors. Yeah. We were a team, you know. Yeah. Christian's now thinking we, we can be, he can join up for a team down in Bloomington next year. Nelson's in, Nelson probably plays baseball too. He's looking at, look at that. Do you play yeah. baseball, Nelson? A, more of a football kind of person. Football, soccer, football, or American football? American football. I was quarterback um, in high school. You were a quarterback? Not, not corner, not quarterback. Cornerback. The defense. Cornerback. Um, on the defense. So you're a fast guy. Okay. Okay, I gotcha. So yeah, I wanted to play too. So, anyways, lo and behold. Uh, Leanne was on my team and we did, I think it was, it was a good project. We had a, a person, another person named Cheryl Murphy, mm -hmm. who's now the vice provost at the University of Arkansas. She's the vice provost for distance education at, at Arkansas. So uh, the two main people on that team have gone off to very successful careers after getting their doctorates at West, West Virginia University. And another person was helping as an advisor in that project, same as Kevin Curry, 
And Kevin was my very first doctoral student. And he became a dean at the University of Pennsylvania at California and became an endowed chair, the Heinz professor, the, you know, the ketchup people out there in Pennsylvania, they, they endowed a chair of special ed. He was the first very, spe very first endowed chair at the University of um, uh, Pennsylvania, California. So three successful people. And so I'm glad that I brought in one of those three people today to talk to us a bit about what's going on in the healthcare field and how her career has changed. I've got several questions written down here for her. And I was, you know, I was thinking we'd bring her in last week, but it's probably better to bring her in this week um, because it's kind of an open week and um, it gives us a chance to hear something that we wouldn't have heard about otherwise. And I've, I, my first question, Leanne, is um, can you explain to us the route of your career and whether it was a planned thing or was it totally unplanned from, you know, from when you entered graduate school to what you're doing today? Was any of that in your vision of, um, but, or um, it, did it all kind of be an iterative kind of process? Okay, good question. Um, and I would say it was a pretty good trajectory from grad school to here. There was one little kink about halfway through, and I'll tell you about that. Um, I went in, you know, I was a psych major at a tiny school in Wheeling, and I was exploring what to do for graduate school. And it seemed like education was what thrilled me the most out of all my experiences in undergrad. So at educational psychology, let's give it a shot. And boy, that department just blew me away. I loved every faculty member. I, you know, finished my master's. They got me a little job. It ended and they're like, just come back and do your doctorate. So, so. Um, Why did I ever leave? It was such a great, you know, all those great people in there, you know, we did have a lot, Ann Nardi and, and oh. Dan Hirsch and Larry Stead, everyone in there. Now we did have behaviorists in there, which is a little different. Jeff Skinner's the daughter and son-in-law. They were interesting people. I liked Julie Vargas. She was really great. Um, so yes, it was a lovely, and you remember Van Densey? I sure do. So Van is a Dean at UNC Wilmington and he just interviewed one of my advisees. Believe it or not, I just sent three books of mine to him. I got a picture with Van, of Van Densey. He didn't have a bow tie on but he's a Dean now. I helped hire him 30 years ago. So small world, you know, it was, it was, a. I don't know why I left. It was a really great, mm -hmm. people were so much fun and the kill old man winter moonshine parties are a blast. I mean, just a blast. Um, our baseball team was fun going out after the baseball teams are even better. Gibbies. Uh, <laughs> Gibbies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and other places that wouldn't nickel. Wouldn't nickel. Both are still here. In the Boston Beanery, which I think closed down. There's during, still one. There's one. Okay. I think so. Yes. So, yeah. So yeah. So I'm sorry I cut you off. I had to add a little flavor in there. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, my focus in grad school was instructional design and technology. So um, I was actually able to secure a job at the health sciences based upon an assistantship I had. So I was working full time before I really even started my dissertation, which gave me a great. Um, audience to, to conduct a study. Um, so um, that was um, academic technologies. I was the instructional designer and then I moved into more of an academic consultant position and decided 13 years in, I just needed a change of scenery. So wait, 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 wait. Rusty Russell? He was the beginning. And really? Yep, he was the beginning. Mm hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about him the other day. I don't know if he's still alive or whatever. I know he's Ann Darby passed away. Yeah, okay. Yeah, All right. If you ever see him, say hi, to, say hi to, for me, okay? I will. I see him on the rail trail. He's got hair about down to here. Oh, <laughs> I had, I had, I had a year ago. I grew it for 13 months. It was way down. It was longer than Nelson's hair. It was, you know, it was really long. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, keep going. Oh, this is old so, memory. So, man, I yeah, should. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, so 13 years in, change of scenery, and I landed in the simulation center. Um, a, because I knew some of the people who worked here and we had had very good rapport and worked well together. B, because I had been a standardized patient. And I'll tell you more about that in the presentation. But my job was to um, organ to really start a program and um, grow it. And that I did. And by the a time- program was, in what? A program oh, in I'm what? Oh, sorry. And standardized patient methodology. So that's a subset of simulation. I'll give you all the deets on that. Um, so then, you know, that grew to where it needed to be. And so they moved me into this assistant director part of 
of education part where my job more focuses on getting faculty ready to teach with simulation and making sure all of the courses are up to par and that we're doing our evaluations as we should. And that all it wraps up in accreditation every five years. So uh, that's what I'm doing now. Sounds really good. Uh, uh, Christian or Nelson, you wanna jump in for anything that's been mentioned so far? And, and again, you can use the chat for posting questions if you have them along the way. Christian? It's great to hear, sorry. <laughs> I wanted to ask like, how, how did you see yourself using design principles in your simulations or in the kinds of projects that you pursued? Um, in simulation, it really pairs up nicely because, you know, as always, you've got a needs assessment. What are we trying to simulate and why is it important? And then you've got your objectives. Every simulation has to have something to guide it. What is it we're trying to get from this experience? And then those objectives tie into an evaluation. Did that simulation work? And the whole process starts over again. So I have a little bit of that in my presentation as well. And did you ever work with the, the actual like technology that makes the simulations or are you kind of just telling someone what to do and like how to organize it? Well, I like that question because I am not a medical professional and that has been a challenge in this position. So in the standardized patient area, the goal is mostly communication. So that's fine. That's easy to manage. But when you're talking about modalities like human performance simulators and task trainers and things that really teach medical skills that I am not proficient with, I rely very heavily on the SME um, to, to create the sim. And I just kind of make sure their objectives look, look good and they're evaluating what they said they intended to teach. So I get the book ended. <laughs> well, I've got four questions, but they're mostly for after you present. But let me ask a couple before you do. How many people are in your unit and how many people go through it as students per year or in a cohort, uh, for instance? Well, we are a staff of about 14 right now. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, that includes our directors, our simulation specialists, our program managers, um, IT support, all of that. Um, and, and as a team, we see 30,000 users in a year. I took out those slides. I didn't think you'd be interested, but oh, I- Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a former accountant. I want numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Our Recover, medical students- Recovering accountant. I'm a recovering accountant. <laughs> <laughs> Our medical students alone come here like something like 80 times. They come, they do an, an, um, an activity, they come back and review the activity, they do a new activity, and it's all, it's embedded in all four years of their courses, and then again into residency, and then again into the hospital. So we see people across the board time and time again. Is it blended or fully online, or is it face-to-face -face and fully online? You have some courses face-to-face, -face, like capstone, capstone experiences, and then the rest. So how, what is it like? It's mostly hands-on, and that was part of my transition. I wanted a little more face-to-face, -face, a little more hands-on learning, and that's that's what we do here in simulation. Now, during COVID, we were able to simulate telemedicine, and some of that has stayed mm. because it's never going away in real life, so we might as well continue to simulate it, but um, really, so it's hybrid in that though materials that they need to process before coming in would be presented at a distance. Right. But everything they do, um, aside from telemedicine, is hands-on in the center. Do you get any online after this? So in a bookend model, you have online before, and then you have face-to-face, -face, then you go online at the end. Do you have any of that kind of thing? Well, you could say so because um, we have a learning management system that records everything that happens in the center. So right. learners are afforded the opportunity to watch what they've done on the end. They can do that from anywhere. Faculty can do their grading from anywhere. They don't have to be standing over the individual watching them mm -hmm. doing procedures. Um, and um, write-ups, soap notes, all of that can be done uh, from a distance. So yeah, sort of bookend. So give us the numbers again, now that you've explained all that. Remind me, uh, how many touches are people using the, your content a year? Is it 50,000? We're over 30,000 right 30, now. 30,000, okay. Mm -hmm. and, and how many people, individual people are you servicing? Well, if you look at 
the size of the classes, we have, we'll say 100 medical students times four, that's 400. Then all of the residents of the hospital, all of the pharmacy students at approximately 100 um, students per um, three years, medical um, nursing students, same. All the axillary, um, ancillary medical programs, we do PT, OT, athletic training. I was gonna ask about OT, my daughter's in OT. Yes, just, absolutely. I've been seeing a PT for my ankle well, <laughs> and I'm my PT. knees. Yeah. 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 So. Um, they'll do some competency work here, but largely okay. communication. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. Um, do, you, go ahead. Um, do you use any um, virtualization in your simulations mm -hmm. or even augmented reality. Mm -hmm. I love that my slides are lining right up to everything you're asking. <laughs> those are my first post questions. So we'll, we'll, Christian and I will go back. We'll ask those after you show the slides. So that, there are some things, my class is very interested in that, that topic. I'm okay. reading their, they, have, they read one of their midterm assignments, many of them commenting on the value of AR and VR in society today and how it's the number one people we've been interviewing we interviewed a couple from purdue who are grads of our program husband and wife who are at purdue and they they said the number one thing in the field is ar and vr and immersive learning uh right now um so yeah that will be very important for us to come back to uh, have, just as an aside have has wdu asked you to teach any courses uh, no, we have a, a cohort within the department who's very interested in uh, creating a master's degree in simulation. Uh -huh. So if we're ever able to get that off the ground, that would be the first actual coursework on this yeah. topic. Uh -huh. Yeah, that would be, be lots maybe of one. Workshop. We do it. We have a certificate program. Faculty come in from all around and learn, have a three day immersive. Um, oh, really? Yeah. And you run that or you're part of that? I do. I, I was part of the design team and now I'm sort of the um, make it all happen person. <laughs> and my only presentation this year was learning theory. So thank you very much, Ed Psych. <laughs> well, that's another thing I didn't mention earlier. I taught four students my last semester at West Virginia, uh, the course on learning theories. And I got to IU. I took my drive Sunday night, drive to IU, and Monday morning, I'm teaching a class at, the same class had 38 students in it. <laughs> uh, much preferred the four, you know, okay. much preferred the four at West Virginia. And, you know, now we have a minimum of 15 in a master's level course, eight in a doctoral course, but at West Virginia, we could have three in a doctoral course. So just you go ahead and teach it, you know, um, very personalized, you know, is, is, you know, it's very flexible in that regard. So if you did a simulate, so certificates are where it's at micro credentials, nano degrees. So that makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. you know, but if you did create an official one, that'd be one of the first ones in the country, probably. Oh, might be. I think there's a program at Drexel, maybe. I was there. Yeah. It's at Drexel. Yeah. I spoke there at Drexel. I know the, the former president of online learning at Drexel, and she's very big on simulations in the medical field. Oh. Um, uh, what's it called? Virtually inspired, virtually inspired. Christian, if you look up virtually inspired, put in the chat, the link to that. Uh, her name is Susan Aldridge. She's now retired, but yeah, Drexel was the place that, that was big virtual simulations in the medical field. Yeah. Very big. Yeah. So you want to uh, take a moment to show us a couple things that you've lined up here? It's like I can share my screen. I think you can. If you can't, I can make you a co-host. I think I've got it. You see yep. my slides? Yep, 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 yep. I have, um, do you see on my desktop behind it too? Yep. Oh. Well, that's okay if it's okay with you. Yeah, uh, it's okay, but there might be a better way. There you go. It's now covering the whole screen. You're fine. Okay. Okay. So what I put together for you is is largely very similar to our orientation to simulation for new faculty. Um, we are, if you were to come off the third floor of the Health Sciences Center, this is what you would see. We're the STEP Center, which stands for Simulation Training and Education for Patient Safety. So our goal is to produce education or to produce learners who are um, skilled enough to keep our patients safe out in the, in the community. So we are accredited um, on all levels from the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. We're pretty proud of what we've done here in Morgantown. Before you go further, go back a slide. Do you have any fun brochures like take a big step, take a small step, 
uh, or you know, uh, we have a fun away. website which is list um, linked down here. We okay, have, great. Yeah, yeah. You can have all sorts yeah. of things with steps. I had a program called Ticket at one point, and we oh, had get the, get the get the ticket. You know, get you know, um, yeah. Take we need your tickets. creativity here. We just don't. Have I to tell you, I'm gonna have to move back to West Virginia. Oh, I know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I should have called you when we were looking for a researcher. <laughs> yeah, you should have called. I, you know, it's close to DC. I could see my sister. You know, and yeah, my niece. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, so what I thought we would do with this 30 minutes or less is to just talk a little bit about what simulation tech methodology is, and then I'll give you a summary of what the four important parts of a learning simulation, and then we can look at all the different modalities that we have, the different fun tools and, and, and uh, what have you if my videos work. <laughs> So, so we're on the same page. What is simulation? We, what do y'all think simulation is? Christian, what's your, your concept of simulation? Do you have one yet? Um, so my concept is generally an animated um, version of a scenario. It's like a scenario. Um, and then you can interact, interact with the scenario. Um, now, I, when I think simulation, actually, I think a little bit past a scenario um, where you're given a, a, a complex problem and you're solving it in a way that's ill-defined and <laughs> then uh, an expert looks at that um, result and judges whether or not you, you did it did it to the level that you should. That's what I, more I think about with a, with a simulation. Yeah, I, I would call it a representation of an event or experience found in the real world uh, with some degree of fidelity, uh, you know, uh, from low to high. So it's a, it's a representation of an experience or event or um, an engagement in a competency or skill. Uh, and you so read it, my slide. No. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're right, that's how we define it. It's um, a situation or environment that allows people to experience a representation of reality. So we're not out in a hospital, we're not in an OR, we're here at the simulation center, but it looks just the same. And the idea is in that environment, the learners get to practice, they get to learn new skills, we get to evaluate their, their um, technique, um, lots of testing here and or they can learn how to work together as a team or um, understand an entire human system. So I think, how much time do we have today? As much time as you want, because I have nothing after you. I'm, great, I'm grading papers when we're done. So, you know, so if you want, you want to go for, you know, I think another half hour or so we have, but we're, we have questions for you, so. Well, let me show you this then, because this is a good anchor, I think. Can you all see my monster sync? Yeah, you might need to sync the audio and video um, in the share. When you share, you have to click the button. So you might want to unshare and then share again and click the, at the bottom of the screen, video and audio button. So you hit share and then look at the bottom under the share. It says sync audio and video. video. Yeah, you have to click both boxes to show a video. Okay. I'm under stop video. Is it in the settings? So if you go into share, if you hit share, you go to the share. bottom of your screen. Okay. Share. And yeah, and you look at the bottom of your screen. Share what sound. does it say? Optimize yeah. for video. Yep. You got it. Hi, Hi, Kim. Hi, everybody. We've had a lot of fun until you got here, Kim. I'm just saying, it's been a lot. You missed a lot of good stuff. You missed a lot of old times in West by God, Virginia. You can watch the recording. Um, so yeah. So we're trying to, she's walking us through a set of slides, but she's gonna try and show us a little video. So I, we love to use this as an anchor just because, okay. I mean, I don't know, I'm a Disney fan. So yeah. what we've got here is a situation with a young child um, sleeping. Yes, just... I hear it and we see it. Good, good, good. Kim likes monsters. 
She's an animal science person. I fell down? No, no, before that. Can anyone tell me Mr. Biles' big mistake? Anyone? <coughs> Let's take a look at the tape. Here we go. Uh, right. Ba -ba 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 -ba. There. See? The door. You left it wide open. Mm. And leaving the door open is the worst mistake any employee can make because... Um... It could let in a draft? It could let in a child. Oh, it's a water news. There's nothing. So what you saw Disney style is exactly what we do here. We put a learner, such as the monster, into a real life situation, such as the child's bedroom. We create a situation. They're supposed to perform an action, the reaction, and then what happens after that? That's our simulation plan. And when it goes off the rails or the monster falls on tax, somebody has to say, hold up, let's talk about this. So the lady behind the glass has everything on video, can show them exactly what they did wrong. And the expert, you know, all of the learners, the other monsters can chime in if they want to. But the big man comes in at the end and says, this is the gold standard. This is what you're taking away. So, um, I want to show you. Um, can everyone see a big blue screen? Yep. This is an example of a simulation here at Health Sciences. <laughs> and it's a before and after nursing student. The nursing student, the first time she experiences a cardiac arrest, and then as an advanced student, how she handles it differently. Hey, guys. Did you see the eye? Oh, he's dying. <laughs> oh my god, I can't handle this! <laughs> I can't do this! So isn't there like a yeah, code like, button? Like, yeah. And she is going back down. Jose! Mr. Carlos! Mr. Carlos! Wake up! Mr. Carlos! So she handled it like a boss, didn't she? I can't see you all. I can't find. We're still here. We're still here. I like to see your faces. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so she, um, first time in simulation, they panic. The learners are just, they're scared. They're, um, our goal is to make them psychologically safe. We try to prepare them for what they're about to experience, but you never know how it's gonna end at the end. So debriefing is so very important to, to get them through. Um, so she, yes, she was one of our success stories. So uh, Leanne, I, I would, went out to Oklahoma City to be an air traffic controller. Um, and I don't know why I didn't think about this experience when, when we were asked questions before, but <laughs> um, I mean, there's radar simulations that I went through daily for probably four weeks. <laughs> um, and they were always very scary. <laughs> there was no real planes, <laughs> but they were always very scary. And then particularly um, there was three scenarios that we ran um, as the final like piece, the kind of capstone uh, work that we were doing out there. And you either passed 
and got a job or you failed and had to go figure out life. Um, and so, um, he's figuring out life still. <laughs> I'm still figuring out life to be fair. Uh, but it was, I mean, I, I all but cried in my second scenario, my last, my last day. Um, and in that scenario, I, I mathematically eliminated myself from passing the third one. So <laughs> I ended up figuring out my life. Um, but it, it was super stressful. Um, there's all sorts of input and like her anxiety in that moment of, oh my God, he's dying. <laughs> like that's real. I mean, that's, that's a, and I think that that's a healthy thing, particularly when you're dealing with life and death um, things, but clearly um, it can be kind of funny at first because the person, you understand it's a scenario, but at yeah. the same time, you heard like, all that inappropriate yeah. laughing, right? Right. <laughs> right. But think of all the ways you can learn. You can learn from a book. You can learn from a lecture. You can learn from watching a video. But what better way than to be in that situation? And what? how better is it to be here where it's safe versus in a hospital room where someone's dying? You know, right. that's, that's yeah. the benefit of simulation. Yeah. And it did start in aviation. The aviation simulators were the very first um, mm. application of sim. So here's how right. the, there are military at first, actually, many of them were military and then, and when they went to commercial after that and now extended into the medical and business fields in law and all sorts of professional endeavors. I mean, so if you're looking, you know, at an airplane simulator, you see the cockpit or a driving simulator, you see the dashboard. Well, here in medical simulation, there's a plethora of ways to do it. So we have in our center, we have four sim rooms, which look like this box here. There's a mannequin, a computerized mannequin setup with all of the um, same equipment that you would see in the hospital, the same crash cart, the same sink and tools. And then behind this is a two-way glass is the operator who tells the mannequin what to do, communicates for the mannequin, makes physiological changes, all based upon a script that a faculty member deems appropriate for the objectives. And then over here in the um, exam rooms, we have 12 of those. And what we have is a standardized patient who is an, a gentleman from the community who we trained to portray a case scenario so medical students can practice their interviewing skills. So that's exactly what they're doing right here is conducting a history and physical. You can see he's in a gown and will eventually pop up on the table and receive a full head to toe physical. Um, down on this, since um, square, we have our clinical skills lab. We have two 10 bed labs. And this one is currently being used for an ultrasound lab. So, you know, our, our first year medical students, they go um, read about anatomy in a book and then they open a cadaver and see, see anatomy for real. And then they come to our lab, use an ultrasound to watch anatomy in action. And they're, they are, wow to death they just love this and our patients love it this is a standardized patient because she can be herself she's not acting out a scenario she's um act is with the student one-on-one -on -one. loves then, it but the cadaver i'm sorry everybody loves it but the cadaver right <laughs> and then the surgical skills lab we have some more way advanced um equipment these are task trainers that simulate um lumbar puncture, this is a chest tube, I think. Um, back here are some virtual reality options for endoscopy. This is a, a, a laparoscopic surgery trainer. Just, and we've, um, since I made these slides, we've added a da Vinci trainer and, some, and a whole new surgical skills uh, suite. But still thinking about education, this is one of the theories we follow. Every simulation has a plan. That's the foundation of what we're doing here. And then the active simulation is the, the active learning part in the lab. Um, but where they really learn is the debriefing. We step out of the room, we talk about it. What happened? What was good? What was bad? What are you going to do? Um, in the future, which is, as you know, is the transfer of learning. That's the pinnacle of everything we want and simulation to be transferred to the real world um, positively. 
So you're, I'm sure you're familiar with Kolb. This is our main learning theory because it's so um, representative of the simulation process. We give a concrete experience, something that everybody does in the room. Um, we take them outside and allow them to reflect on it. What happened? How do I feel about that? How can I think about that in terms of what I'm going to do when I'm out in the real world? So that combines both simulation and debriefing. And finally, when we're trying to determine if simulation worked, we look at Kirkpatrick. You know, we look at how did the learners feel about their experience? What's their reaction? What did they take away? You know, do we do give them a pre-post test? Do we make them write a soap note? What did they learn? And then we watch their behavior. You know, have, has their behavior changed as a result of this simulation? And what we hope for are results, the outcomes in the hospitals and um, the real world again. So we have four, four components to make this happen. The first is the pre-course materials. Um, actually, I'll break these all down for you. Pre-course materials, pre-briefing, the scenario, and the debriefing. So the pre-course materials are important so that that learner isn't thrown into a simulation with no background. They have to know what concepts are expected to be known, what background there is to the case or the um, procedures that they might have to conduct, and any history behind the whole um, um, scenario. That's all before they come into the center. So that could be and is often virtual. Sometimes it's a lecture, but more often than not, it's virtual. But the pre-briefing happens in-house. We, we have to secure a room big enough for everyone who's going through the simulation. We sit down and talk to them. What is the objective for this exercise? And you have to be very careful that you don't reveal the main, reveal anything that would um, affect their performance. So like if we say this patient's gonna have a heart attack, well then we don't have, we don't, they can't deduce the fact that it's a heart attack. You know, we have to say this is a cardiac um, scenario. Um, so besides the objectives, we talk about expectations. What do we want you to do in that room? what's in that room available for you to access and use, and um, also kind of setting the scene for what's gonna happen. Who is the patient? What do you know about that patient? And, and so on. So by that time, and they're given the opportunity to ask questions. So at that time, they're ready for the actual scenario. And this depends a lot on what modality you're using. Um, excuse me, most of what we do has a script attached. So whether it's a standardized patient who has to uh, reiterate that script, or it's a simulation specialist who has to use the script to make the mannequin work. <laughs> so it's very script-based. Um, and all of the instructions have to be given in advance to the operator and to the patient. There's a lot of training involved for the patients. But we want to make sure that, that that situation is safe, not only physically, but also psychologically. We don't want to put them through any undue stress. We want to make sure they're successful. We want um, to be very supportive. And of course, we're targeting learning gaps. So the whole scenario is set forth to create a situation in which they can learn new skills or correct poor skills. And um, we tend to embed some challenges. So it's not just a straightforward, easy ABC. Um, but also there's um, um, perhaps a medication error or some, um, something that's challenging to the learner while they're in the room. And um, when that happens, we have to determine what the consequences will be. So it takes a, a fair amount of thought ahead of time. What, you know, the objective is for the learner to administer oxygen, but what happens if they grab a bag mask instead? You know, um, are the stats gonna change? How are we gonna redirect them to do the right thing? There's a lot of pre-thinking involved in a case scenario. And I think more so for the mannequins than for anything else. But finally, the debrief, this is immediately after. They, they leave the sim room, go across the hall to a debriefing room. So it's very fresh. And they talk about, um, well, it's a really, it's a discussion. It's um, two way, it's not a lecture by any means. It's a conversation about what happened in the room. It's very interactive, reflective. Why do you think you responded that way? Or how would you do that differently next time? And really it's a technique just to close those learning gaps that we had isolated before. Oh, and here's a, you know, a simple way to do it. what do you think about what happened in there? Um, you know, and, and 
you know, why, what happened? Let's talk about it. What's, what's your takeaway for clinical practice? And that's the biggest part of the discussion. So most people in simulation say, you know, an event, a debriefing is twice as long as the event that um, occurred. So I'm not going to show you this. This is a, a video of a, a Zoom de, uh, debriefing. It was, it was quite well done, but we don't have enough time to, to show that. But I would like to um, not um, miss this opportunity for learning management. Um, well, you know, if you think you don't have time, if you want to show us 30 seconds of, of that or a minute or two, we do have, you know, you can, you can just show us a piece. Um, so this was maybe a background you know, here. Very, very patient centered and that's super hard to do. Um. This, um, the activity was an interprofessional um, scenario, meaning there are medical students, pharmacy students, nursing students, and probably OT as well. We're all working, nutritionists, they were all working together to help a lady who was discharged from the hospital after uh, heart surgery. And we actually take them, we, we use one of the uh, mobile, oh, I forget what it's called, but it's a iPad on wheels. Mm -hmm. So from here, we can take that machine into our patient's actual home, wheel it around and look at all of the mistakes that we placed around. So we, we put out tripping hazards and spilled medication and things that students should notice. Um, and then we use the iPad to interact with the patient. Some people call that a robot, but it's not really a robot. Um, yeah, there's another term for it. Christian, you were saying? The virtual presence, is that the... Yeah. Kind of a virtual presence, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, these, so they did it virtually. And this is a group of, of learners who've just interacted with the patient and a very skilled debriefer. She's um, an occupational therapist. And... You can hear what she had to say. Promoting patient safety, improving health. Great job. Thank you, Sorry. Susie. All right, so Chloe kind of let off my first thought about your whole group process is I love the fact that you guys were so patient-centered. Um, you respected sure, sure. everything she, sh she said, um, and you gave her options if she was kind of uncertain about first one that you gave her so every profession did that quite nicely on your suggestions and your alternatives so you know very very patient centered and that's super hard to do um and you guys you guys did really well with that also kudos um we've been doing this for quite a few years and i facilitated you know a good bit of sessions and you guys did a really good job with the gentle conversations about smoking and alcohol use. And that is super uncomfortable, right? And many students like steer away from it, like I'm not even gonna touch that. Or they kind of giggle when they see like the maker's mark empty bottle or something, you know? Um, you guys did a really good job about um, providing the, you know, the hard discussion, you know, the reasons why it's unsafe and really focus. So eventually she gets to what did you all think? and the students chime in on their perceptions of the whole event. Uh, it's a little different too, when you're talking about a, a, a medical task, you know, if they're talking about a surgical skill, the debriefing is gonna be quite different <laughs> than, than talking about a patient interaction, but um, all of it's captured in our learning management system. So we can, we, we record all of that, we can give, our um, tests, we can um, annotate videos and um, evaluate as well. We use CAE. So, you know, not to um, be remiss about the modalities, I know you want to see some of the tools that we use, and there are four categories partial task trainers or task trainers, standardized patients we've mentioned, the computerized mannequins we mentioned, and then the XR that you already asked about. A task trainer is a um, single um, procedure. So what you're gonna see here is a, a nursing student learning how to do an IV. So she is, she has her set up exactly like she would in a hospital room, except there's a severed arm and not a patient. <laughs> so she can stick it as many times as she wants to. No one's gonna say, ow. Um, but she's using the exact same procedures, the same um, you know, alcohol swabs, the same needles, everything. 
is expected to be um, the same. And the beauty of this is they can practice as many times as they wanted to, but they don't have to hit record until they feel proficient. And that's the recording that the faculty member will grade. And again, they don't have to be standing there making them nervous. They can grade um, from anywhere at any time. So that's one example, an IV, but here's a ton of examples here. We have um, you know, ear, ear models that are just different ear maladies. You pull one ear out, put another one in. Um, eyes that you use slides to show different eye problems. Um, procedurally, the more advanced learners learn how to do airways, can do intubations, um, central lines, all those things that you don't want to practice on a human because they say, ow, <laughs> these things don't, don't care. Um, and then many of them are ultrasoundable as well. Ultrasound is a big part of our curriculum. So like the nurse who drew blood on me two weeks ago, couldn't find any blood and put, yeah. just kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, let me try the other arm. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I can't yeah. find any blood there either. You know, and I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, didn't you have any simulation? Go to West Virginia and get some simulation training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no harm done here. <laughs> no harm. Move along, move along. Uh. Our standardized patients, I think I mentioned, are human actors. They're, they're role players and they interact with, um, this is a nursing student who's looking at a rash that we put on her leg with a little bit of makeup. We do everything from you know, easy, simple rashes to gunshots and slash marks and uh, um, cancers, all kinds of what we call moulage. And what it does, it um, adds realism. So what better level of fidelity than an actual human being? You, you can't get much more high fidelity than that. Um, we can train our actors to say the same thing every time so we can evaluate learners. Lots of, of testing and called um, objective structured testing allows for accurate assessment. Um, it does require a fair amount of training. There is a cost. Our, our folks get paid $20 an hour to do this and to get you know 100 medical students through multiple activities, a little bit expensive. But they love it, we love them. This patient is moulaged really well. She's been in a car accident. Um, we can also, you know, so we can turn into trauma events, um, a wide variety of communication. If we want professionals to know how to interact with one another, we, we can do that with patient standardized patients. We can do medication review, again, ultrasound. Bad news, that's a great way to, to practice breaking bad news. We can have actors who actually cry in the room. And, and, and um, So I have to tell a little story here. Uh, about five years ago, I, had, I, I came to class with fake blood in my Saturday morning class, my Saturday class. And I had three or four, maybe five international kind of, I was hosting international students and, and Fulbright scholars. And I told them that yeah, we prepped this. I said, are you going to take over the class? And teach the first part of this a five-hour class so they end up doing first four or actually the whole class and they just told the students that dr bonk had an accident he hit a deer on the way in and and all the students got petrified you know and they were calling me on the phone are you okay dr bonk go to the hospital no i'll be in shortly i'm just got to clean the blood off the police got to file a report and i did the whole so i i you know finally i showed up about a half hour late to class i come in you know kind of groaning and the blood's on my arm, on my face, on my arms and all this. The students felt so bad for me and they're looking around, you know, and uh, and the, and my my international students are taking over the whole class. They did a wonderful job. My point was anyone could teach a class, you know, <laughs> and I had to get them to, to experience it. But then my one Taiwanese student comes, here's some special, you know, whatever it is, special medicine to put on your, your hands and your arms and all this. She's giving me this stuff and <laughs> and uh, and and about four hours in, I finally had to go up in the front of the room with all during after break, and I, and I finally told them the truth, you know, because they were really feeling bad. I mean, all these I had a couple of Coast Guard guys in the class, and they're looking at me, and they're oh my god, you know, and and I was just acting, you know, I was having fun, mm -hmm. and um, and after I we told at eleven or twelve o'clock, the class started at eight o'clock, and and um, the students, don't you ever do that again, you know? One of my <laughs> students walked up to me and raked. She says, don't you ever do that again? And then five minutes later, where can I get some of that fake blood for my class? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you I knew student, you were a trait standardized patient. <laughs> yeah, I had a student from Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan. She went back and did that in her country. And uh, I have this new book, um, Transformative Teaching Around the World. And she's got a chapter in this book now. Um, 
because she talks about innovative pedagogy using my models. But anyways, yeah, I've done this kind of thing. Uh, not every day. It's not just, you know, you got to try stuff out, you know, once That's a while. awesome. No, I've, I'm, I'm being this distractive student again. Go ahead. I'm, you know. <laughs> Well, hopefully you got a chance to look at this long list of things that our patients do. They they are really very versatile. And here's some nice photographs of them in work. This was um, an Ebola simulation prior to COVID. But I oh, think, God. Yeah. <laughs> that was a while back. But dentistry, they bring in their own chair and supplies. And here's a physical exam. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I do enjoy the standardized patient. But the next, <coughs> excuse me, highest fidelity we offer is the human patient simulator or mannequin. So they can be, uh, we have low fidelity mannequins that are basically weight that you can stick and prod and do, um, do procedures on, but then the higher fidelity mannequins are computer um, driven so that you can administer medications to get a physiological response. Um, also, there are you know, heart sounds and lung sounds and pulses and bowel sounds. So there's a huge variety of applications for the mannequin, but they're very, very expensive and they do, um, they do react to wear and tear. So they have to be uh, replaced periodically. But um, learners can, can really delve into some, some pretty complex problems when it comes to um, clinical situations with the mannequin. Here's one guy in, in the room. Um, here's the mirror. You saw that what was on the other side, the control panel, but this is a very typical high fidelity mannequin and all of the equipment. Again, this can show his vital signs and um, they can um, run all of their procedures um, like that. So here, so, you know, sometimes, um, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen in, in simulation. And, and sometimes you, like I said, you have to really predict what hey, might go hey, off the rails. Hey, so here's a guy man, talking to his mannequin. Okay, your ankle's hurting. Ever have any yeah, chest pain or anything? No, no, I'm not having any other pain, just my ankle. Okay, it looks like you're breathing kind of quick, maybe. I'm gonna have a listen to you. I hear a lot of wheezing. Are you sure you're breathing okay? Yeah, my breathing's fine. It's really just my ankle. Okay. I'm a little more worried about your breathing right now than your ankle. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna start bagging you, okay? <laughs> there is no wheezing. So I don't know if you heard that, but the faculty member is behind the glass saying, oh, but it's my ankle that hurts. I, I'm, I'm fine. And then eventually the guy grabs the, the bag and, and the faculty says, there is no wheezing. <laughs> a little redirection. Um, there, you know, th these things don't operate themselves. There, it really requires a lot of um, effort behind the scenes. So, last but not least, we call it XR, which, and we talk about um, virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. And let me tell you that we have some expertise here, uh, Dr. Bonk. If you ever want a, a presentation on this, it would not be me. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, we're starting some new work with um, collaborations with uh, faculty too. So um, what I can tell you is that um, some of our extended reality equipment involves um, ultrasound. So this is a TEE trainer, transesophageal echo. And this um, fact, this learner is using an ultrasound probe. And what he's learning is the look of the ultrasound on the right of the screen and how it pairs up to the look of the anatomy on the left. So it's a kind of a really neat bisection and way to, um, to learn what the, um, he should be looking for before he does the intubation and the, the further procedure. So you're, you're immersed in the environment. Sometimes um, we can use the virtual reality headsets and the anatomy will just rise from the body. You can walk through it. It's very um, impressive. Um, extending reality again in the bronchoscopy and endoscopy machine. This is the virtual reality part here. The learners are physically, you know, conducting the scope, but watching the result here on the screen. So we learn it through um, the laparoscopy, you saw that, and also our newest acquisition, the anatomage table. This is a virtual cadaver. So, um, 
this, this um, image can be taken from skin level all the way down to the bones and they see every layer in between. So it's um, also designed to be a teaching tool. You can click and identify and get the cell bi biology and it's um, kind of anything. So in summary what, of um, this little does talk. The, does the um, human cadaver have a scent that they associate with it? <laughs> Thankfully, no. Thankfully, there's no formaldehyde. <laughs> yeah, disgusting. But we do use good theory. We use good design. We create a good simulation, follow with a good debriefing with the overall goal of having a great healthcare professional out in the world. Oh, give you some references if you want these slides, but I'm here for questions. So Kim is in animal science. So I'm sure she's experienced some of the simulations, but in, with a different species. Ah, uh, I, I right? have, I have, I, um, I've used some of the, um, the cadavers. We've, we have some, um, it, well, they're, we have something very similar to that. I've never actually done used a whole bodied animal um, mannequin, I should say, not a cadaver, but mannequin. We, we have cadaver animals that we can get pretty easily because we have a farm right on campus. And so any animals that um, are euthanized, we typically don't euthanize animals on campus unless there are extenuating circumstances that warrant that from a veterinarian. But if there are animals that do pass away, which happens um, not often, but it does happen, um, then they are preserved in a freezer and then we use them. And we don't like to do that. Be, we don't like to use that so much because we only have so many and the, the, the smell is quite awful. <laughs> Awful, um, and it's not from aldehyde. <laughs> but but um, but we have used the simulation, um, like tissue. I don't know, like the the mannequins, but they're not mannequins. They're for animals. And my only thing is, um, they're super expensive. Mm -hmm. Like for us, the cheapest one that we can get is five hundred dollars, and that's one to do a captive bolt stunning for um for captive bull, uh, for essentially euthanizing um, animals that come through our meat lab because we have a, a meat lab and a processing facility on campus. Mm -hmm. The ones that I use um, for reproduction are anywhere between a thousand to $5,000. And those are not whole body, they're just the reproductive anatomy. Okay. Um, so how do you fund that? <laughs> How are you getting the money to do this? <laughs> That's my question. Are you using synthetic skins or is that? Yes. Okay. Yes. We, you know, we repurpose those a lot. We have um, a, a nice little supply and I know they're terribly expensive and, and the guys have good ways of, of repurposing those. And the other thing we do is um, for dermatology and some other things, we buy like pig's feet or hog trachea or just stuff that the packing plant is throwing away to practice. Um, individual skills. But your question is funding. And our primary source of, of um, income, I guess, is the students. We have, each student has a lab fee, depending on their school and how often they come in. Um, in addition to that, there's a lot of philanthropy going on here. We've, we've received millions and millions from um, alumni. And it's a lot of work getting you know, getting those donations, but it works. Um, we have a little bit of revenue generation from some of our programs that travel. So, one, you know, our standardized patients teach sensitive exams too. They, they teach small groups of people how to do, say, the gynecological exam, but they do it on their own bodies. So it's um, very interactive and very well sought after program. So we can send them around the state and charge you know, double what we pay them and it creates some revenue for us. Um, I don't know if that helps, but those are- No, the, it does help. I, like when you just said lab fee, um, that's, an, that's one that we haven't done a very good job of charging our students lab fees. And that would be a great revenue stream, at least for us. Yeah, so. I mean, when you boil it down, you know, for example, we teach four students at once. If we charge- 
$200 for a session, they're only paying 50 bucks, you know? So um, just think about it on a per capita basis and it's not as expensive as you might think. So in West Virginia, you now have a president who was the president of Ohio State, Jordan, <laughs> Gordon Gee, right? He's very successful in bringing in money. He is. Um, and your hospitals are very successful in bringing in money there. Yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I should say that um, Kim is at Su the SUNY system, not too far away. She's in okay. SUNY, SUNY Cobbleskill, Kabul yep. which is, you know, where within the SUNY, which, which part of the state in New York? Um, so it's um, about a half an hour southwest of Albany. We're the, right. one of the smallest SUNY schools, standalone SUNY schools. So um, I have four questions for you, but I don't think I'm gonna ask all four. We're gonna run out of time here. Um, what, what are recent advances in the medical field that relate to emerging learning technologies that my class should be interested in exploring? What, what aspects of the emerging learning technologies intersect with the medical field today? Well, by emerging learning technologies, you mean like the, the virtual reality trainers? Yes, anything. Collaborative technologies, mobile learning, you know, ebooks, you know, any of that, AI and education, um, you know, maker spaces, all this is emerging learning technologies, right? Open open access articles, open education movement. Or, or, you know, flip classrooms, you know? Well, you know, like I said, we're so hands-on. Um, mm -hmm. Our, of course, our research, research is really important here at STEPS to disseminate what we're doing is, is helping. So um, we use, you know, MedEd portal a lot. I think you might consider that an open learning forum. Um, um, what else? We're hoping that you know AI becomes more of what we do. We're not thrilled about um, artificial patients yet, although we know we've collaborated with some people who want to create a computer-based standardized patient. And it, it, I mean, this has been years in the making, and it's never really been quite what it needs to be. You can, um, but it's getting there. You know, they they're trying to get the emotion in and. Um, I yeah, really the empathy wish. skills you see at Stanford, they have people put on the headsets and they have an experience of what a, someone in their 70s or 80s feels like, you know, and they can yeah. empathize. So the empathy training through simulations yeah. is something. Mm -hmm. I also know that open education, there's a lot of open med, as you mentioned, medical tube, you know, there's teacher tube, there's med tube. Um, there's lots of cases available online for an, anatomy classes and and uh, other early medical student classes so they can run, they're freely available um, kinds of things were, yeah, so. And we get a lot of our scenarios from Ed Ed Portal. There's a yeah. lot of sharing there. There is, there is, the medical field has been tapping into this because they had funds to build the stuff through grants and then what do they do with it once they're done? And one way is to, to share it with other universities, you know, once it's been completed, so. There's a suite of cases across disciplinary areas for nursing. And I've spoken to nurses, and there's a lot of stuff you can find online for, te for nurse training or physical therapists or occupational therapists and, and medical doctor training. So um, I was going to ask what we are on the cusp of, but you've kind of mentioned that you think that AR and VR is, is an area that we're on the cusp of. Very much so. So uh, how has your role there changed in the past few years, if at all, or how might your role change in the future, what you're currently doing? Well, um, the biggest change, I, I guess, um, was from focus on just one little aspect of simulation, the standardized patient program, to learning more about the other modalities and their medical applications. So mm -hmm. I know, it's hard. I know as an instructional designer, you, you don't really have to know that content, but it's it's really kind of hard when you're working in simulation. So I, I could see maybe trying to interface more with the medical 
um, content and the simulation specialists who are all paramedics to learn a little more of the, the content. But um, my next um, big project here is, is in evaluation. So we have to make sure we're doing purposeful evaluation and we're um, evaluating outcomes. Okay, so you're into evaluation. Can you give me one success story when you're doing your evaluation research? What's something, what's, what's a success story you'd like to, to share with us? Oh, there are quite a few, I guess. Oh. Um, <laughs> let me think of a good one. Um, I believe it was a medical student and Yes, and they had been through our, we teach the um, AHA classes and, and the most basic example of that is basic life support. And um, this, he was out in clinics or something and the guy drops dead or drops over and simulation helped him jump right to, um, you know, uh, resuscitation skills. Right, yeah. yeah. I spoke to medics at Fort Sam Houston right before COVID, like weeks, two weeks before, and they were telling me some of the same kinds of stories, you know, down there. Um, it wasn't just medics, but a lot were medics. Well, now that you mentioned medics, we we teach them the gynecologic exam using the method I, that I described earlier. And, you know, imagine sending second year medical students into a room knowing they're going to perform a gynecologic exam on the teacher. They go in white faced and pasty. They're passing out. They're scared to death. But across the board, when they leave that room, they are overjoyed. They're relieved. They're um, thankful. They're competent, and um, that's one of our very best activities in the entire medical school. So yeah, I'm glad you reminded me of that. Um, Kim, Nelson, Christian, do you have any final uh, questions or comments? I, I have a question. Christian, do you have a question first? Go, go for it. Okay, <laughs> so my, my mom and my two aunts are nurses. And um, my mom is always taking to keep up her medical license, these um, trainings. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that any of this could be adapted to that continuing education in nursing? And how do you see that happening in the future? 100%. We are director of simulation for nursing is, is quite involved. Um, Again, not being the contact expert, I don't have a good example, but I can tell you our continuing education is mainly on um, teaching with SIM. So we were able to outline our objectives and our methods. We hand it to the CE office and they turn it into something that um, allows for credit. So I would say any, any skill would require coming to the university, conducting the skill and then being checked off and, and certified, but certainly the world is open for that. I have a book with that title. <laughs> oh, that's right. I have it here on the show. <laughs> that's, back, that's back when I had a lot of money, I could send books out to my friends. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> my, you know, my newer books, no one's seen. <laughs> so I have a, three books on MOOCs and open education. Look at you. Uh, around the world and the global south, all this. Yeah. Wow. Global South is the newest one. Yeah. Um, you know, the world is open was a hard one to write, but a fun one to write. I want to do the world is wide open book and I'll interview you, Leanne. We'll, we'll, we'll get some good stuff from West Virginia in the book for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. Maybe this summer. Um, I'm right. hopeful, but I'm going to do a calendar. So I've been running every day for, like I said, it's been 724 days and I wrote philosophical quotes the first 500 days. And I want, and I took ten thousand pictures of mainly Indiana. Wow. So I want to turn those into a daily pull-off calendar this summer. Um, so Eight. that made two thousand twenty-three calendar with, with the thoughts on leadership, learning, and life. So every day I reflected on leadership, learning, and life after running. I wrote, like I said, two thousand different ideas, thoughts down. So Sign I'll find me the a copy. I will send Sign you a copy. Too. Yeah, <laughs> I'll go. It'll be on Etsy, but I'll give away copies to my friends. You know, <laughs> uh, at least digital oh. ones. Gladly. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, I mean, a, that's a different kind of project. It's something that Christian would do. You know, that's that's, that's the kind of stuff Christian likes to dabble with. Right. <laughs> Random. So, <laughs> you know, and I think Kim Kim once would like to take a sabbatical and do that as well. So, you know, I would so, love that. Love it. <laughs> I thought so. Yeah. 
So yeah, Kim's on sabbatical and just hanging out in my classes. That's what she's oh, doing, nice. you know. <laughs> 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 taking the monster this is a monster syllabus 100 page class not much of a sabbatical and you're stuck reading a 100 page <laughs> syllabus and and i had the gall to expand it after the class started you know so um <laughs> so christian had a question for you go ahead christian yeah um it actually is a little bit of a parlay off of kim's um talking about pd and continuing education um do you, have you worked with other institutions to set up like a national network of yeah. simulation centers um, because I mean the, it, you're working on a model essentially you're, you're creating a model of education uh, through simulation um, at West Virginia and it's a model that I think is extremely important um, and very needed maybe each each center needs to figure out their own funding source, <laughs> the biggest uh -huh. problem probably. Um, there's always lots of professionals, but you know, <laughs> funding is the problem. But um, is there any work like that happening? I think you may be referring to our, our um, Society for Simulation and Healthcare. Oh. They, they are the conglomerate of all of the simulation centers really across the world. And okay. then from that, there are subsets. There's an ASPE, um, the American Standardized Patient Educators Committee, and there's AGMA, the GTA MUTA Society. Um, and I'm sure there are those for mannequins and other modalities too, but the hub is really the society and they have lots of opportunities to interact with others. We, you know, I'm on a committee to help provide webinars, which you know, serve as continuing education and- yeah. And uh, it's pretty, yeah, it's very, very active. And every people from here, we have um, we have six people now certified by the, the society. We have um, several who are certified healthcare education specialists, two who are advanced, and one that's working on the um, operations specialty. So yeah, it's um, pretty, a pretty advanced society, I think. It's, yeah, it's, no, that's really cool to hear. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking about all the other applications for it too. Um, one example is my husband is electrical an industrial electrical contractor mm -hmm. and they're constantly um, needing to refresh their um, employees. They're all union um, electricians, but they're constantly having to refresh their skill set on safety things. So you have to do lockout tag out. So whenever you're working on a, a electrical circuit, you have to have it locked out at the panel to make sure that nobody gets shocked along the oh. rest of the circuit. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the big things. It's a safety concern um, that if you're not the person that does that all the time, um, it, you can kind of forget some of the steps along the way, even though it's a very process oriented thing, you could almost have a checklist for it. But um, that type of simulation um, is really important. And so your simulation center for health could be extremely applicable in lots of different realms, whether that's the electrical field for safety, whether it's, you know, by, you talked about Ebola, um, anything that anything that happens um, without any, um, any amount of regularity. So maybe it's like a nuclear reactor meltdown, like what do we do? <laughs> so the, the things that, that you're learning in those, that the model of the simulation learning that you're doing is is really applicable to a lot of different realms very much so our birthing mannequin for example she does all of the shoulder dystocia and breech birth and the bleed outs that no you know not very many moms fortunately have <laughs> yeah so christian i have to connect you to one of my doc students bill ball who's studying uh, electrical worker professional development and training. He's, he's yeah. revamping. He works for us. I forget the company in Evansville, but uh, if you've not had Bill Ball in class, I, you know, I'll, afterwards I'll connect you to him. No, and I'll also, Leanne, have one student just about ready to defend her dissertation on micro you know, badging back, you know, and all that. So, you know, yeah. I, yeah, I'm on 20 people who are dissertating right now, 10 as advisors. It's, I'm reading lots of dissertations. Oh, my. Um, oh, my. <laughs> I got a call this afternoon. Once person studying in, in Kazakhstan, the teaching of English. I was ex I wasn't expecting her to 
the rage to defend, but she thinks she's ready. So I, I add that one to the list of many. Um, this year is going to get 10 or 12 people done this year, I think. Um, wow. So a lot of people going through. Christian someday, right? Christian someday. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so I think Nelson's had his, had his microphone ready to rock and roll with a question for a comment. So uh, go ahead, Nelson. Yeah, uh, I was just going to ask, what are some skills that students in instructional design programs should be able, should be honing on to be successful in a simulation program like yours? Well, a part of our certificate program is, um, again, you know, design theory and objectives. And we've talked a good bit about evaluation. So, you know, I think that might be might be the the key because you know the um, design of the scenario often is in the hands of the subject matter expert. So it's the designers who would help guide them in creating, you know, and isolating what it is they want to teach, what their tasks are, and then evaluating at the end how did it go and what can you do better next time. So in my humble opinion, those are the the two places where you would focus. That's great. Do you have any like? What are some tools that you use for evaluation that um, maybe as students we can have access to? On our website, we do have um, some links to different um, validated instruments. So um, it's mostly checklist, yes, no, did the student perform the task or rubric, to what degree did they perform? And we, we put those into our own learning management system. Um, we have developed a communication, um, a communication um, evaluation, I guess, since we use it so frequently, we really need to run some validation statistics and get it out there. But um, yeah. What is, what, what is your LMS? It's called um, CAE Learning Space. Is that built in West Virginia or is that a, me a medical field related? It's a simulation field. It was designed specific for simulations. Mm. And um, there are probably four or five of them out there now, but we feel like learning space really is the most robust. By the way, Leanne, one of my first students at IU, after I got to IU, came to my office. Well, she wasn't also my advisee. She was Dr. Ray, Charlie Rayluth, who's pretty well known in the field. She was his, her, she was his advisee. Came to my office, she says, I need an independent study. Dr. Ray Lewis says, I need an independent study. And I said, um, well, I'm working on this project. All these, when I got here, a lot of people were, were interested in writing and computer conferencing and writing, which we were doing at, at West Virginia. And so I said, you know, we could turn this into a special journal issue and um, you can be my assistant. So that's your independent study. Well, it actually it ended up becoming a book. It's called Electronic Collaborators, published by Erlbaum. Well, lo and behold, the job that she has is working for a company doing simulations. No way. So I need, I need, she's, she's, she, her husband's a vice president of Disney and she's, so you like Disney stuff, right? Yeah, cool. Um, so she lives in Celebration City in Disney, you know, basically the city they built. Um, but yeah, she's, she spoke to my class a few years ago and we have one of our articles assigned in week three during the simulation week. I don't know if the company is called Connective. Um, I'll find that, but maybe, yeah, I might, I might just, I might make a, a YouTube video and share that with her and then try and connect the two of you because yeah, I mean, you have some, some common interests, I think. Yeah, um, fantastic. You know, um, she's built simulations for the medical field in effect. Oh, uh, branch, branch, branching simulations for okay. the medical field. Yeah. And, and she's written on it, published a couple of articles related to it, but doesn't want to be a traditional academic type, you know, like much prefers not the, the, the run around with your head chopped off as a faculty member, which Kim can, can empathize with, right? Kim? I sure can. I sure can. <laughs> so yeah, her name's Kira King. So um, it's, yeah, it's known as the bonking book. It's, it's, <laughs> It, it, it sold a lot of copies early on, but for some reason we got a lot of returns. And they, we didn't, they didn't have the pictures that people were expecting that they would get in that book. Um, <laughs> a little wry humor, a little bumpy and humor along the way. <laughs> on a Monday night, and it's a good way to wrap up a Monday night of, uh, during spring break. We've had a special guest tonight, uh, Dr. Leanne Miller, 
oh, I knew as Leanne Hill when I had her as a, as a doctoral student in one of her first classes <laughs> when she was a graduate student getting out of the little school in Wheeling, West Virginia, right. where they have the Wheeling feeling. What was the little school in West Virginia where you went to undergraduate? Wheeling Jesuit. Oh, Wheeling really? Jesuit, a great school. It's a really great there. school. I think. Is that up north of Wheeling itself in the little little isthmus they have? Or no? mm, it's no, it's kind of just right on the suburbs. It is okay. Mm. Is it on the river? It is not. It's near the hospital. Okay. All right. I, I have to visit sometime. Anyways, it's great to have you with us, Leanne. I will visit you in Morgantown before I get to Wheeling again. Excellent. Uh, you know, I, I definitely, I'll take a road trip. I'll see, you know, I can get to see my sister in DC. I'll stop in Morgantown along the way. Looking forward um, to it. And see my friends. So uh, it's so great to have these memories that we had. Uh, you know, uh, I wish we could turn the clocks back and have another kind of connectors baseball game. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and yeah. And it would be so much. And, and, uh, Are you going? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That too in Louisiana. That was fun. So ERA, you know, it, it'll be real special this year. It, you know, 35 years ago is my first AERA. And, to, you know, um, so to have the, uh, the, the felt be a fellow though, making me this year. So it will be really fun. You should show up. Yeah. We're having a Friday afternoon, you know, you should show up for the, the happy hour. I'm, I'm hosting a happy hour. So, oh, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm going to post this to the cloud here. If I can find the cloud, it's going to stop the recording.